Captain Joseph Galladay, Major David Galladay. During the Civil War, Private Jacob Estep, CSA, Private David Frabel, Private Joseph Frabel, Private William Frabel, Private Samuel Hockman, Private William B. Hoover, Sergeant William Robinson, John LaRoe Stoner, Private Raphael C. Will. In World War I, Major Guy A. Benchoff, Private Samuel G. Clark, Private John Stewart No. This serving during World War II, Master Sergeant Randolph Ambrose, U.S. Air Force, Sergeant N. Luther Hauserman, U.S. Army, Seaman First Class Jack Benchoff, Navy, Commander Robert Benchoff, Navy, Colonel and Chaplain W.T. Brundig, U.S. Army, then Rick Buffum, Private Robert Cook, U.S. Army, Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Corman, Jr., Air Force, William F. Dogg, Jr., Navy, Sergeant March Delinger, U.S. Marines, Henry Dyer, Army, L.L. Garman, Jr., U.S. Navy, <clears throat> Sergeant William Galladay, Army, Noah Good, Navy, Sergeant Robert Hammond, U.S. Air Force, Master Sergeant Scott Hammond, Air Force, Corporal Darrell W. Hefner, Air Force, Signalman Third Class Wayne Jennings, Sr., Navy and Air Force, Corporal Vernon Kelly, Army, Auburn Lambert, Army, Sergeant Howard Lambert, U.S. Air Force, Tech Five, John P. Lambert, Army, Lawrence Lambert, Army, Tech Five, Warren L. Lambert, Army, Private Robert L. Lineweaver, Army, Sergeant Guy D. Lutz, Army, Major Harold W. Miller, Jr., Army, Dick Miller, Army, Private First Class Earl Clogger, Air Force, Private Owen Ricker, Army, Private First Class Ray J. Rudolph, Army, Private First Class Clifford Sign, Army, Carol Seibert, Douglas Seibert, and Corporal Gordon Seibert, all in the U.S. Army. Private First Class Reverend James Smith, Jr., Marines. Commodore Robert Sollenberger, Navy. Sergeant First Class Ted Sollenberger, Navy. Sergeant John Stoneburner, Army. Lieutenant Stephen Tornich, Army Marines. Seaman Second Class, Bowman D. Walton, Navy, and Private Fred Will, U.S. Army. From the Korean War, Spec 3, Robert N. Arts, United States Army, Private Ray Cook, Army, Sergeant Bernard Howard, Army, Sergeant John Hollingsworth, Army, Corporal William Krantz, Army, AO2 Gordon Lambert, Navy, Staff Sergeant Donald Miller, United States Air Force, Sergeant Cap Green, Army Engineers, Airman First Class Donald Sheets, Air Force, Airman First Class Jack Sheets, Air Force, Private First Class Jim Trott, Army, Donald R. Wright, Army, James L. Wright, Army, Marvin Wright, Air Force, Spec 2, Richard Dick Wright, Army. From the Vietnam War, Tech Sergeant Dan Bowman, Air Force, Spec 5, Homer F. Hoffman, Jr., Army, Sergeant Tim Dahl, Army, 
Spec 5, John S. Galladay, Army. Spec 5, Samuel S. Galladay, Army. Corporal Mike Good, Army. PO 3C, Chris Lambert, Navy. E5, Danny Lambert, Army. A1C, Ronald J. Lambert, Air Force. Private Bobby Lineweaver, Army. Captain Ed Marco, United States Air Force. First Sergeant Frank Painter, Army. Corporal Gary Clogger, Army. Diver Thomas Rucker, United States Navy. Spec Corps Richard Buckstrom, Army. Tech Sergeant Joe Sider, Air Force. Master Sergeant Gary Sider, Air Force. Staff Sergeant James Dick Sider, Army. Tom Sider, Staff Sergeant in the United States Army. Private First Class Jerry Sign, Army. Spec 5 Phil Stoneburner, Army. Specialist Benny Swan, Army. Sergeant C.F. Wagner, Army. Airman First Class Charles E. Walton, Air Force. Lieutenant J.G. Karen L. Walton, Navy. MP Jack G. Wright, Army. Recon Sergeant Kenneth D. Wright, Army. Spec Corps Wayne D. Wright, Army. Lieutenant Colonel Randy Young, Army. Those serving in more than one war. Captain Brian Bose, Army during Afghanistan and Iraq. Chief Warrant Officer Robert L. Dahlgren, U.S. Army, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Desert Storm. Lieutenant Colonel Roller Galladay, U.S. Army during World War II and Vietnam. Staff Sergeant Jake Johnson, U.S. Army during Iraq and Afghanistan. Staff Sergeant Justin Coons, U.S. Air Force in Iraq and Afghanistan. Sergeant First Class David Plogger, U.S. Army, Vietnam and Desert Storm. CW02 M. Lyle Richards, U.S. Marines, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Tech Sergeant William Bill Sider, U.S. Army and the Air National Guard during Vietnam and Desert Storm. Sergeant Ben Swan, U.S. Army, World War II, and Korea. Staff Sergeant Alan Wetzel, U.S. Air Force in Desert Storm and Afghanistan. Those serving during time of peace, Staff Sergeant Daniel Bast, Air Force. Sergeant William F. Bolt, Army. Robert Danley, Jr., U.S. Navy. Anthony Dyer, Army. Harry Dyer, Air Force. Private First Class Omar Frabel, U.S. Army. Mitchell Heisman, Army. Stuart Heisman, Army. First Lieutenant Vernon Heisman, U.S. Army. Alfred Holsinger, Jr., Army. Barry Holsinger, Army. E4 Clarence Jennings, U.S. Navy. Airman Mike Lambert, U.S. Air Force. Spec 4 Richard L. Lambert, U.S. Army. Chief Rick Lambert, U.S. Navy. Private Matthew Lineweaver, U.S. Army. Lance Corporal Jerry Lytton, Marines. Spec 4 Robert Bob Rhodes, U.S. Army. Sergeant Glenn Wetzel, U.S. Air Force. Spec 1 Andrew P. Walton, U.S. Army. We like to remember all our veterans on this day. If you have any veterans with us today, we ask you to please stand, be recognized. Joe, Bobby, we thank you for your service. I'm sure you all noticed, but in case you didn't, any veteran that would like to take a small American flag or some of the narthex, and you can pick those up on your way out. Thank you.
whereas the 11th of November, 1918, marked the cessation of the most destructive, sanguinary, which means bloody, and far-reaching war in human annals and the resumption by the people of the United States of peaceful relations with other nations, which we hope may never again be severed. Boy, do we ever. And whereas it is fitting that this date should be commemorated with thanksgiving and prayer and exercises designed to perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding between nations and inviting people of the United States to observe the day in schools and churches or other suitable places with appropriate ceremonies of friendly relations with all other peoples. Although Veterans Day is not a holiday on the Christian church calendar, it is a good time to recognize the people that were spoken of this morning and how many there were members of our congregation and friends of our congregation who have served in times of peace and times of war. And some of these people made the ultimate sacrifice, their very lives. And many who saw active duty in war times sacrificed mental, spiritual, and emotional health. For all of them, and for those that we have not recognized this morning, we want to give thanks for their sacrifices. Sacrificial, sacrificial living, by the way, is a part of our calling as followers of Jesus. The Apostle Paul had something to say about being sacrifices, living sacrifices. This is what he says in Romans 12, and I'm reading from the Message Translation. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as a sacrifice and offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. This morning, I want to recognize, we need to recognize, all of the living sacrifices that are being made in this time, not for self and not for glory, but for the simple reason that it is the best that we can do for God. Medical professionals, not only the degreed ones, but the people who do really hard, dirty work, who clean, who cook, who wash bedding and instruments, grocery workers, farmers and truck drivers, school personnel, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, and older siblings who have been drafted into an army of digital learning assistance, law enforcement personnel who do their very best to live up to the ideals of the law under tremendous pressures, mothers and fathers who stay at home to raise children all the while sacrificing years of their careers. <clears throat> and today we think of poll workers and ballot counters. <clears throat> Congress was on to something biblical about the kind of sacrifice that all of us are called to make perpetuating peace through goodwill and mutual understanding and friendly relations with all other people. I hear echoes of Ephesians 6.15 in that phrase. Ephesians 6.15 goes this way. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Our country, perhaps our world it seems, has drifted far off course. We have from that proclamation by Congress back in 1926. Paul continues on in Romans, 2, Romans 12 2. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without ever thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize that God, what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, 
always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. We become living sacrifices when we do what we do, even if we've been drafted into doing it, dragging and kicking and screaming the whole way, when we do it as if we are doing it for God. Washing dishes, cleaning floors, running a small business, making change or changing diapers, doing those things while maintaining peace with grace is sacred and holy work. Work that each and every one of you does every single day. God is in it when we do it as if we do it for God. Some days in this past year, peace feels next to impossible when we get sucked into the vortex of our culture. And it is easy to lose heart when we see what's happening in the world around us. That was the case for the Thessalonians. They were waiting they wanted something new to happen, and they were waiting and expecting that Jesus was going to return at any time, and he hadn't yet. And they wondered, why haven't you come back to save us? And they had questions about what would happen to their loved ones on the day that the Lord returned. And I have to tell you that oftentimes when I ask a question on behalf of one of my loved ones, I'm actually asking it for myself. I have to wonder if they wondered what would happen to them when they died. I, I heard part of a passage from a book by Eric Bale, it's called Eschatology, which means end things, that for all but the last 180 years of Christianity, followers of Jesus long for the day of Jesus' return with hope an expectation, not dread or fear that they might be left behind because of some unconfessed sin, surrounded by the folded clothing of the faithful few who had escaped this earth, our vision of that day has been deeply influenced by fear-filled rapture theology. And that came onto the scene 180 years or so ago due to the interpretation of one single Greek word, parousia, which is translated common in the English text. The people in Paul's day knew that word. They were completely familiar with it. They would know it as well as we understand the word hard drive, or at least I think most of us do. Um, but we don't understand parousia. The, the, we need it to explain. The closest image that we have of a parousia event is a modern day parade. In Paul's time, a trumpet or a herald would sound to let people know that a very important person was coming to the city and everyone would get out of the city to greet that person, beginning with the highest ranking or those with the most honor to line the path to greet and receive that person into their midst. And Paul is saying that since Jesus is coming from heaven, the only way for us to go out and greet him is to meet him in the air. You know, quite frankly, I think we might be very surprised by who rushes out to greet Jesus with us. Labels like Democrat, and Republican, Confederate, or Yankee aren't going to matter. The only label that will be important on that day is beloved child of God. And that's, that's you, beloved children of God. There is nothing here about leaving the world. Rather, it is about greeting Jesus and the new kingdom that Jesus brings to the earth with them and our loved ones who have died 
Are they going to miss out? No. Paul says that they are going to be a part of the most honored group to receive Christ when he comes. It's not about just a select few persons leaving earth, fleeing earth before it's obliterated, for that would mean that sin and death win in the end. Instead, we have a hope-filled future where God comes to us. God dwells with us. God brings in God's kingdom, a reality that is completely free from sin and death and all its effects. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait for that day. Isaiah says it this way in describing that day. And because it's about a mountain, I like to think of it as being about here in the Shenandoah, in the valley looking up to the mountain. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. God will destroy the shroud that is cast over all peoples the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. God will wipe away the tears from all the faces and will take away the disgrace of God's people from all the earth. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation for the hand of the Lord will rest upon this mountain. That is the God to whom we are invited to make living sacrifices, to bring in peace and wholeness and justice and love in this world of great need. Each and every one of us counts. God counts on us. May it be so. The Greek word was Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. I will pause at different points in the prayer for you to say in your mind silent prayers. O oh Lord, we wait for you to come again into our midst. Sometimes we wait patiently, oftentimes not. Always we are aware of how much the world needs you. Today we pray for those in our community who need your healing and comfort. We pray for persons in leadership across our country, for President Trump, for President-elect Biden, for all of the justices of the Supreme Court, for our Congress and our Senate, and the leaders of every state and community, that together we might make wise decisions. We pray for the brothers and sisters around the world whose lives are torn apart by war, disease, and violence. <clears throat> we pray for the saints who have witnessed to us of your love the saints that we remembered last Sunday, the people whose names were called today, and those in our own lives who have had such powerful witnesses to you and your love and your way. We 
we pray, knowing, God, that you are with us now and that you will strengthen us to keep us awake, to keep the faith, to keep working for the time when Christ will come again to surprise us anew with love and justice on <clears throat> earth. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We want to take a moment to recognize one of the veterans in our congregation who has also served